For our final part in this subtractive synthesizer series, we're going to bring in some very different looking instruments that all follow the basic same subtractive principles that we've been talking about and dissect the preset. And hopefully this will make you feel more confident in bringing in any kind of synthesizer and then hopefully being able to break it down and modify the preset to whatever you want to do or to, you know, make a sound completely from scratch. Every single way is completely viable. So here we have Polymer and this one at its oscillator source is using a wavetable and it is scanning through the index. So this is an example where we are doing true kind of like wavetable-ish synth stuff. But at the same time, I see that we have a filter engaged and I can see that there's some kind of an envelope or some kind of a modulation depth being set here. And inside of Bitwig, when you see the little like blue lines like this, you know that that's being impacted by something, by some kind of a modulator. Um, and we can see that we still have our standard envelopes here. So nothing is, is too crazy. Let's listen to the patch first. <laughs> And it's a very nice sounding little lead patch there. The first thing I'm going to do is I'll just go into the effects section and just turn off these two effects because that's more of a sound design thing that's not really utilizing the synthesis engine. With a lot of synths that you'll bring in and presets you'll bring in, you'd be amazed just how much the effects processing inside of that instrument is influencing the overall sound and that the moves that you make inside of the actual synthesizer may not have as big of an impact as you might think. So that's always kind of stage one when you're dissecting or breaking down a preset. The next thing I'm looking for is the sound source. And I can see that that's here. That's this wavetable. We also have a sub oscillator with standard shapes. So I'll just go ahead and find that balance again. And I can see right away that there's something that's impacting this index. And the fact that it's just going back and forth like this in a pattern is telling me that that's probably an LFO. So let's see if we can find where that LFO is inside of this instrument. We can show our modulators here. And this is moving relatively slowly and it appears to be following this LFO here. And I can bring that in. And when I hover over the little blue line, we see that that corresponds to the index. And I can adjust the relative depth of that modulation here. So I'm just going to bring that down just a little bit, just to show you that we're impacting it. Cool. We can see that we have some other modulators. So while we're here, let's just look at them. Here we have a pressure, which is impacting the vibrato, which would be a little bit of a pitch change. Now notice that I do not have any kind of aftertouch on my keyboard, so I am not able to access this at all. But if I was to go in here to manual, I would then have manual control right here, and this is gonna then increase the depth of the pitch modulation. And again, we can see that that's corresponding to the global pitch right there. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move my mod wheel around and just see if it's making a change. I do see CC1 here already set up, so that's leading me to believe that yes, the mod wheel does have an impact. Ah. And you can see that this little blue line is getting impacted. So let's go in here and take a look and see, and I'm assuming that it's set to the uh, filter frequency. And when I go and hover over, again, I can see cutoff, and there you have it. So that's how our mod wheel is working on this particular patch. We also have common expressions. So the most common one is velocity. When you hit the key, what happens? And that is also impacting the cutoff. So the harder I hit the key, the higher up that cutoff frequency is going. And if I just barely tap it, we can see that that changes. One other thing in this instrument, and this is a Bitwig thing, is that I know that that symbol also corresponds to velocity. And in this case, it's referring to the amplitude envelope. So just how loud or how soft it is based on how hard I hit the key. And you'll see down here, it's gonna say velocity sensitivity. So let's bring that all the way up to 100. Now I'm barely gonna tap a key. And you can't even hear anything, I'm gonna hit a little harder. 
So that is where that control is coming from. Again, that's another form of modulation, but we haven't really even touched on the actual filters or the envelopes to this point. So let's go ahead and look at that. So we can see again in this instrument that we have cutoff modulation amount, and that is going to then correspond to this symbol down here in this envelope. So we do have some movement happening in the filter. Let's get rid of it completely. And now I'll start to bring it back up. So it's got a pretty long delay time there. I'd have to hold the key for two seconds to get us back down and change that sustain level. So if I want this to be a little bit quicker, I like where it's at there, so. Certainly am happy with that. We have our amplitude envelope here, so let's say that I want to add on a longer release tail. A lot of times you'd want to then also go to the filter envelope and kind of match that so it's an even smooth fade. And finally, let's just look at the other couple things that are going on in here. So we can see that we have a control for resonance. And that's just a macro control, that's just a knob. And also for unison detuning. And this one is a little bit trickier because you're wondering, well, where actually is that control? Because I don't see anything getting highlighted. And this is where just kind of being willing to experiment and click around is going to come in handy because I know that in this instrument, that is corresponding to the detune here inside of this wavetable oscillator. And the final thing that I didn't mention is that we do have key tracking happening on the filter as well. So as I go up the keyboard, this is going to slightly move. But remember, this is also corresponding to velocity. It's corresponding to a lot of different things is changing that filter position. So let's just get rid of that. What I'd also like to do is turn off the velocity. So let's go into our expressions and just get rid of that for now. play some low notes, go play some high notes, and now let's change that. So it tries to basically smooth out the relative amount of harmonics if you turn a little bit of that on. Um, again, that's not something that we talked about in the previous two videos, but this comes back to that whole idea of, okay, every synthesizer is going to have some unique and esoteric controls that you can kind of explore on your own time um, to modify presets or to create your own sounds. So this is our first example looking at a built-in instrument inside of our DAW, and again, just applying that basic information from the previous two videos, even though this instrument looks drastically different to what we were looking at previously. The next instrument we're going to look at is Dune, which can be a very overwhelming instrument when you first bring it up, but it boils down to those same fundamentals that we've already talked about. Oscillators, filters, envelopes, LFOs, other types of modulators, a modulation matrix. That's really what it boils down to. Now, again, there's some unique things about this instrument, specifically the fact that you can take control over the individual voices and you can then make adjustments inside the oscillator section, for example. And that takes this instrument to another level. But really, it's still the same basic subtractive principles. So here's the first preset that comes up. I'm going to move the mod wheel. Okay, so we can hear that the mod wheel is having a big impact on the sound, and we can see that the filter cutoff, there's a big change happening there. So as we turn that mod wheel up, the cutoff is moving. There's also just a modulation matrix amount, which I think then is just kind of increasing that overall effect when I do move the mod wheel. And then we also have the mod wheel going to the effects one delay dry wet. So we can hear 
the degree of the um, delay there. Let's turn all the way up now with the mod wheel and we're not gonna hear that same degree of delay. Let's just get rid of it and now let's see if we can hear the delay. So yep, you can hear how that's working on the sound. That's just making sure that we're saving space when all of those additional harmonics and stuff come in. I don't have a breath controller, so this is having no effect whatsoever when I'm playing keys or anything. So I could just turn that off or get rid of it completely if I wanted to do that. And for the first time ever, we also see we have this multi-stage envelope generator and it's number one and it's controlling the pitch semi. And this is happening so freaking fast that what it's doing is it's just creating that transient at the front. Let's turn it all the way up. hear how the delay and the reverb are trying to react to that. But let's actually go ahead and turn off the effects so that this is more obvious to us. So how do the effects work inside of this instrument? Well, again, you have this unique control over the various voices. And we have four voices, and we can actually see that all of them are going into effects bus one. So if I go to all and I turn this off, we would no longer be hearing the impact of the effects that are going on here. And this is where, again, practice with these instruments and these things, it makes a difference because you just kind of have an idea of how the actual topology is working, but it's not any different to any other instrument we've worked with. We've just turned the effects off globally, and now we can hear without all of these effects working. And now when we start to increase this, we're gonna hear that more obviously. Hear that clicking. That is a nice effect actually. And to be honest, it really doesn't matter what you set this to, it's not gonna throw off the instrument being in key or whatever because it's just happening so quickly. Okay, so the next thing we have to address is that arpeggiator. And just like we saw before, with all of the voices here that are active, and I guess they just did it universally all the way across the board, um, arpeggiator one is what's at play. So let's go to arpeggiator one, and it's a unique one because it's a MIDI file that's been loaded in and it's playing this chord progression. But simply enough, I can just turn that off. Now we have just our basic little stab. So we could adjust the filter. Turn on key tracking like we did before. There we go. We could change the type of filter here. can change the amounts going into the filter envelope. So happy with that. Now, a couple other things to just be aware of is things like the routing. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that we go into filter one first coming out of the oscillator mixer then we go into the effects and then we'd have filter two that we could play with and apply if we needed to do some additional shaping. So very interesting, you could change the routing here. Not that important for what we're going over and covering here. Really essentially that's all there is to this instrument. Now I could go in and we could look at these various oscillators and, and talk about the different forms here. We have a wavetable, we have FM, all that good stuff that we haven't really talked about too much. But really the cool thing with this instrument is again, what you have here with like density, amount and tuning. And this is very unique to this instrument. So for example here, let's increase the density to like 30. And I want it to sound kind of bad at this point. And we're gonna go through and try some of these other modes. Sounds nice. We can definitely get this to sound good. Let's maybe change the waveform to a pulse wave. 
And then if we want to do pulse width modulation, modulation, we're going to set that up exactly the same way we've done before. Let's just solo out oscillator one. Oscillator two is more of just a sub oscillator, it sounds like. And in the mod matrix here, we're going to, let's go to number seven. Let's grab LFO number one. And we need the destination to be oscillator one and the pulse width, where is that? There it is. Let's set an amount. Let's go to LFO one. Do something like that. Cool. There you have it with Dune. Obviously, this instrument you can go so much deeper into, but as long as you understand those fundamentals, you can then experiment and play with some of the other unique parts and aspects of this instrument. Um, some of these patches, I'll be honest, you'll go into them and the mod matrix will be da 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 And if you then can't get that sound into the window that you need it to go into, I would recommend trying to find a different sound because it can get really complicated in here. Um, but at the end of the day, Dune, just another subtractive synthesizer. We don't need to be overwhelmed by it. With that basic knowledge we have, we should be able to figure things out and get the sound that we want. Here we have Zebra, which is one of the most intimidating instruments for music producers, both for programming from scratch, but also for editing presets. And in this case, we are going to work from an initialized state just to kind of go over the signal flow. And then obviously, if this seems like something that gels and, and jives with you, you can look more into this instrument and, and figure out how you can take it so much further. Really, a lot of the power here is in this grid and the way that you can run oscillators into each other or have four separate chains. It's really crazy what you can do. But... I want to stress that it's still the same basic fundamentals, or we can work with it that way. Over on the left, we have access to our sound sources and also our shapers. So our filters are going to be available in here. And then you have some other specialty stuff that you can do to, again, take your sound further beyond just basic wave shapes. Then over on the right is where you're going to find all of your modulators, your envelopes, your LFOs, and other things that you you know, maybe select down here as a modulation destination. Whenever you select a new modulation destination, assuming it's not something you have access to down here, for example, like these multi-stage envelopes, it will pop up here for you to then work with and mess around with to get the fine tuning. So right now we have just like a sawtooth wave in here and envelope one is hardwired to be the amplitude envelope. So let's add some release. Get rid of the sustain almost completely. Bring that decay down a little bit. Get ourselves something that's just a little bit more plucky. If we wanted to turn this into a mono mode or retrigger legato, we could do that down here. But I am just going to go right back into poly mode for now, and we'll work with it in this mode, just like what we've talked about with the other instruments, things you can explore and experiment with. So from here, I'm going to go into my oscillator one, and we can see we have this sawtooth wave here. Maybe I want something different. Maybe I'll go in here to something like saw silk. And we can see that when I then change this wave control, we are changing these various stages in the wavetable, essentially. And then we have other smoothing modes and things like that if we do want to modulate this. And it's currently set to the key follow and all the way up. So you're going to hear low note, high note. Let's bring this down. So you can hear that when we have that all the way up, it's letting a little bit more of those upper harmonics come through, keeping a more consistent sound from top to bottom. And that's just something that's built into the preset there. We have different stacking modes. Let's go all the way up to 11. And let's detune it. And that's already a pretty nice sound just like that without having to do any more work. But we can take this further. We can turn things on like the pulse width modulation. Let's see how big of an effect that has. put about there and then let's have this go to the LFO so LFO one let's find that there you are LFO one set some range on it so we're 
hearing that then change a little bit over time. Always easy to break these things too. <laughs> So that's a little bit subtle. Let's go with the syncing. Let's turn that on. And let's also then have this go to LFO1. We also have oscillator effects we could get into, as well as the mixer just for this first oscillator, including things like width and volume, et cetera, panning. But let's go into the effects because that's a little bit more fun. So let's grab an effect and let's choose trajector. And again, we could then have this going to something like, let's just pick something different that we haven't looked at. Let's actually use one of those multi-stage envelopes. So I'm gonna grab one of those. Let's go in here. that's kind of cool. Obviously, there's so much you can do with this multi-stage envelope, like turning on looping and all sorts of different things. Do we have some presets? Is that what this is? Yeah, we got some presets. Let's choose, let's gate. Let's do something weird. Okay, let's listen to this. There we go. It's a little fast. So let's go into quarters. There we go, that's fun. I'm just gonna make this smooth it out a little. We got something totally new and unique. Okay, so let's add in some kind of a filter. There we go. Okay, so here we have a filter now. And we could create a new envelope to control this filter, envelope number two. Put your little key fall on. Choose different modes here. Let's do vintage. Let's do something fun. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Very cool. All right, so let's bring many voices up so nothing's cutting off. And you can see that just at this very basic level, there's a lot we can do. And we could find all of those same parameters that we looked at before. We have the pitch bend that we can control. We have our glide, if it's appropriate, okay? Um, and then we also have an effects that we could go into here. So if I wanted to add some kind of an effect, I would do that down in here, or I could even do a send and return configuration. But let's just do something like this. Let's just add a chorus on. But I just want you to really hear it. There we go. That's a good frequency. Yep. And 
in just a few minutes, we created a really wild sound using Zebra and keeping it simple. Um, but obviously you can go really complicated with this instrument and do all sorts of fun stuff with, you know, X, Y pads and things like that. We haven't routed it to anything at this point, but this is an amazing instrument and one that shouldn't be slept on even in just a standard form, even just subtractive, because it can still do so much for you and get you some unique timbres and tones. For our final synthesizer example, we'll go to the other extreme and something with just a very select number of options. Doesn't mean that this synthesizer is any worse. It's just as valuable and viable as Zebra, just depends on the situation and the sound that you're going for. So you can see that we have an oscillator section, we have filter sections, amplifier sections, some modulators built in here, some glide controls, some additional modulators here using velocity or using the pitch wheel. And let's go through all of these things here and, and talk about them. So right now we're not gonna hear anything until I turn one of these oscillators on. So I'm just gonna go ahead and turn on the square wave. And then we have some pulse width modulation controls that we can take advantage of. Let's put that onto the LFO, turn up the depth. We can change the shape of that if we'd like. I'm gonna go over to random. Cool, I'm happy with that. We have our high pass filter if we wanna thin out the sound or take out some low end. In this case, I think I like it. Then we have our more standard low pass filter. Add some resonance. And then we can take advantage of our envelope here, our ADSR. So if I crank this up, I can hear the highest point it's gonna get to because we have sustain all the way up. We'll go right about to there. We also do have the keyboard tracking turned on, which I can maybe turn down slightly if we're gonna be using this envelope so much. All right. Now notice the release is not gonna do anything at this point because our VCA, our actual amplifier, is just spitting out a gate message, meaning I hit the key, it comes on, I let go, it turns off. If I wanna use the envelope to control the amplifier, I can do this, and now both our filter and our volume are being controlled, and the release is gonna have a, a role to play. Now, what really makes this instrument unique is the chorus module. So while this is more of an effect and has nothing to do with synthesis, this is gonna change our sound drastically and give it much more of that analog E type sound. Now, if we wanna go down and use some of our other modulators like velocity, we can do that to control something like the volume, so soft note, and then hard note. We could also use it to determine the depth of the envelope, which we're not gonna do at this point. And then we can use the pitch wheel to control some things like the filter or the actual pitch of the oscillator. So let's put that onto filter. And that's me playing with the pitch bend a little bit, so we could do that. Interestingly, we don't have any access to the mod wheel as far as I know. That's probably how the actual hardware works as well. And finally, we have a portamento, so kind of our glide controls, and we have the ability to set that up into working in legato or working on, you know, always, every time you hit the note. So let's first go ahead and increase the max poly to 12, just so we can play some chords. But now I am gonna go ahead and take advantage of the portamento. So once I flip that on, I'm no longer gonna be able to do that. So let's add some time to this. And we're gonna hear that when I don't play legato, we're hearing that envelope re-trigger. If I do play legato,
you can hear the envelope um, doesn't re-trigger and we're getting that pitch slide. We could also go to the always mode where we are now going to actually hear that jump. And that will be true whether I'm hitting um, in legato or if I'm re-triggering. So essentially that is how this instrument works. Let's turn this back off because I think it sounds better in this fashion. But that's where we're going to leave things, I think, for this particular instrument. We'll have a couple of conclusions just to wrap up and call it a day. The main point of this video series has been to show that those core features, those core knobs or sections are pretty universal amongst lots of synths. So even though a lot of people may not specifically classify Zebra as a subtractive synthesizer, you saw how we used it as a subtractive synthesizer, found those key components, shaped those to our liking to get a sound. Um, and really the thing is learning the basics of synthesis, specifically subtractive synthesis, is really simple. It's the sort of thing you can do in a day. But the challenge is then knowing which synthesizer to use in what situation. And there really aren't a lot of shortcuts to that. You can do a lot of research, and sometimes that does help. So you're like, okay, well, what synthesizer did so-and-so use on this track? And that can be useful, because that can give you an idea of, of what to try and what to use first. But there's also still just a part of this that is trial and error and building up a knowledge and an experience base where you might bring in five or six different synthesizers to create a bass sound. And the settings might be pretty much identical, but the timbres are so different. And hopefully what you noticed as we went through is the sound of the polymer versus the sound of Dune versus the sound of Zebra versus the, the sound of this tall you know, and this goes on and on with every single synthesizer you bring in, is different. And sometimes it's drastically different and can be the difference between having your track sound like it's in the right genre or having your track sound very dis jointed and kind of unnervy to the listener. Even if your, your synthesis or your sound design settings are good, you still have to make that selection of instrument. And you'll notice that in something like Dune and in Zebra, we have the ability to do some drastic stuff to the oscillators. You saw that we had those like blending and detuning modes and, and all of that with the harmonics that are coming in. And in Zebra, we had the oscillator effect and we modulated that and that, that totally changed the timbre of the sound. In the, the unit know there's that chorus that's like a big part to that instrument sounding how that instrument sounds like that's a major reason why you would bring that in and being able to then determine what to use in what situation is how you get better so just knowing these key features and controls that is very important it helps you modify the presets or create your own presets but then the challenge and what's going to take the longest amount of time is building up that resource bank in your head of knowing what instrument is appropriate in what situation. And I wish that I could just transfer all of that knowledge directly to you. And I wish that I could be given that knowledge from other people way more experienced than me to then have to make my life easier. But that's kind of how I want to end this video. So just the reminder that, you know, you can know all of the controls on a synthesizer and know how to manipulate and edit the sound. But if you don't know what the right instrument is in the right situation, you're not doing a ton with that other knowledge. So it's about finding and striking that balance. And I will get off my soapbox, call that the end of the rant, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Take care, until the next time, bye.